Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I am here with my friend, Dr. Natalie Marks. Um, she is, she's amazing. Uh, she's a practicing veterinarian. She's an entrepreneur. She's a lecturer. She's a writer. She does so, so many things. I really love an article that she wrote called The Daring Release of Perfectionism. And she talks uh, a bit in this article about dealing with perfectionistic tendencies as a leader in practice, as a veterinarian, um, as, as a colleague. And then when we get into this episode, we talk a little bit about uh, her own um, sort of epiphany that perfectionism was undermining what she was trying to do and how she sort of wrestled with that. And man, it, this is this is one of my favorite conversations of the year. It, it really is. I hope you'll give this episode a chance. If you uh, if you see yourself as a bit of a perfectionist, if uh, if you work with people who are perfectionists, and uh, and you you know you recognize that it's a double edged sword, this is a really good episode. So anyway, hey, I hope you'll really enjoy this. Dr. Natalie Marks is amazing. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Natalie Marks. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me back, Andy. It's good to be uh, here. It's wonderful to have you. You have been here uh, at least three times. I just, I really enjoy you. You are, you are. You were my discovery of 2023. I think I don't. I don't know that you were on before 2023, and now I just I can't have you on enough. I just I I enjoy so much that you're doing. For those who do not know you, you are an educator, a consultant, a practicing veterinarian in Chicago. You are a leader in the Fear Free movement. You were uh, a member of the original Fear Free Advisory Board. You have won um, crazy awards that I have to say I'm super jealous of. You were in 2012, you won the Pet Plan Veterinary of the Year Award, which I was like involved with putting on that ceremony and stuff. And and so it was a, if people don't remember, it was a big, it was a big deal. You were, um, you were, you were voted America's favorite veterinarian by the American Veterinary Medical Foundation. Like, do you just, you just rack it, you rack up big big awards and you're doing so much it's amazing to me either you make you make me tired and i do a lot oh my gosh <laughs> well that's saying something because i feel like you're always on the go too oh man um well, well you know it's interesting you bring that up because it sort of relates to what we're going to talk about today which is yeah. just that overachieving drive right that a lot of us um also kind of uh coincidentally have with perfectionists and so i'm curious to see what we can tease out yeah, I no, I agree. I, I think I think you're exactly. It's funny you you're exactly right in in that that is the setup for for where we're going. You wrote an article that I that I saw and I really liked. It was in today's veterinary business. It was called the daring release of perfectionism, and in it you talk about um, you say that our colleagues, clients, and patients are better served when we simply strive for excellence over perfection. And so one of the, one of the things I so, uh, sort of appreciate about you is I, I, I see a number of my own tendencies, you know, of just like, have to be the best. We have to, you know, we have to accomplish more. Uh, you know, we, we have to make a bigger difference. We have to get more, uh, more things done. And I, and I really personally wrestle with this a lot because um, there's, you can push yourself for perfection to the point that it becomes counter productive. And I have right. often struggled with trying to figure out where that line is of pushing myself hard enough that I continue to to make progress and feel good about what I've done at the end of the day, but not push myself into the negative place that I've been before where I'm like, mm -hmm. Andy, you've got to let some of this go. So let me sort of pause there and sort of let you sort of lay out your thesis on perfectionism. Yeah. You know, it's, as you mentioned, just when we were chatting, it is a really significant double-edged sword, but I think has sort of overtaken the veterinary industry because so many of us just to even get into veterinary school, right? We were told we have to do, um, you know, get almost straight A's, right? Our academics mm -hmm. have to be stellar and we have to um, do all of this sort of extra internships or volunteerism ahead of time. And you should have done a research project and maybe should have also, you know, have these recommendations, which means you have to do this extra. And it's all about um, truly overachieving, right? Because there were only so many spaces with, you know, how many applicants, although the situation has changed a little bit, certainly with the, the shortage of veterinarians, but certainly when you and I were in school, that's how it started. You get into school and it's 
let's throw how many what, 36 hours of caseload at you every you know every semester many of us had jobs many of us were volunteering doing you know working at clinics um but i think the the kind of t the underlying theme that connects that in as taylor we were talking about taylor so it's the invisible string that connects so many of us is that we want to be perfect yeah. in it, it starts in a healthy way and i think many of us maybe were raised that way or encouraged that way or genetically have some of that in us or all of the above nature versus nurture however it was we ended up at the same place that in order to be the best we have to be perfect and what i found as i was sort of thinking about this and reflecting on especially my year as as practice owner I found that it often led more to detriment than to benefit, not just me, but to my team, to my, the families and clients I was working with, to my patients, to my family, to my friends. Um, and it's the, the key though. And I think the trick is identifying it in the moment versus having to do this reactive approach that I'm doing right now. It's hopefully helping, obviously, in this next chapter of life. But so many of us have our blinders on and are so busy in the muck of practice. And I say muck in the po most positive way, but you're in yeah. that daily grind and not realizing that if you just take a few of hopefully the tips and tricks we'll talk about today and apply them, these are not major things. These are sort of if you've read about atomic habits, right? These are little things that can make a huge difference in how you feel, how, how you present yourself, how you're received. But I, I think the goal of all this is how can we make veterinary medicine a lifelong career? Yeah. Because I okay. think that is a key of why so many of us have left, why there's, a lot of people have said, right, I, I just can't do this anymore be because of this. There's Well, there's so much to unpack there. So I, yeah, I, I, I completely know. agree. I think, I think we select for perfectionists going into vet school. And so those are the people who who go through the hoops uh, and set themselves in a place where they get selected. And then when we get trained, I think we train people to be perfectionists, right? Like right. we don't, we don't. And again, this is, I know things in vet schools are changing and their curriculum is evolving. And I think it's, it's wonderful. But generally we don't work collaboratively in vet school. We work as individuals and we're graded on, you know, our, on our on our perfection, uh, on our completeness, you know? And so, so I think that we select for people who have that, that, fixation and then uh and then we and we further train to that and then we put them out into a scenario where honestly being a perfectionist just from a pragmatic business standpoint is really limiting the you know the vets that really thrive are ones who are okay with something not being exactly perfect as long as it's good enough and they didn't have to do it and it's like that's how you leverage staff that's how you're able to get more done but if you if the only way that something is good enough is if you yourself do it that's, there's no way, there's no way out of that. It's, it's, uh, it, it's absolutely limiting. Can, can you flesh out some of your comments? Cause I think this is important to sort of get our heads around. So you say, you know, perfectionism is not ideal for our team. It's not idea for our patients. It's not idea for our clients. C can you sort of flesh out what that looks like? Cause I think some people would say, you know, why is perfectionism not ideal for our patients? How is, how is that true? Right. Well, let's, so let's start specifically just right with medicine. And I, what I think both of us, and I don't mean to speak for you, but I would assume you would feel this way. We aren't saying, I'm certainly not saying, you know, just strive to be sort of, you know, average. <laughs> just, and, you, know. you know, if you're treating, mm. if you're doing surgery, it's sort of an average way, that's fine. Not, yeah, not, what <laughs> not saying, at all right. where we're getting at. But um, I think a perfect example, and I'm glad that I went right to surgery because I think this is a key. When we, as perfectionists, we often will think to ourselves one of two scenarios. Um, let's say you are a brand new associate and you're like, I have a client that comes in and they want to have a gastropexy and you've never done a gastropexy. Many perfectionists will actually do one of two scenarios. They will either say to themselves, I've never done this before. I don't want to fail. So I'm not even going to learn. Yeah. I, I'm not going to take the steps. I'm going to decline this. I'm going to shy away from this because if I can't be perfect, I shouldn't even try. But there's another camp of perfectionists that will say, you know, ooh, I'm going to admit to myself, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I would never let anybody see that fear. I would never let, I would never ask for help because God forbid they see me having a vulnerability. 
So I'm going to try this surgery, even though inside I'm terrified and I might make mistakes and you probably will make mistakes and the patient's going to be under anesthesia longer. You're not going to understand the shortcuts and perhaps there's going to be even complications, God forbid, but they might be. Mm -hmm. So both of those scenarios, perfectionists can lean to, but if you notice those are extremes. Yeah. And what we want to think about is how can I take fear, which fear is such a innate and sort of natural, you know, survival instinct we all have, but we don't want to be guided by it. Yeah. Um, I, I work with a life coach and I have this amazing, she gave me this amazing sort of imagery of how to keep my fear in check. And in my head, I have a boardroom and I'm sitting at the head of the table and I have all my emotions sitting in their chairs, right? And every emotion that I have when I'm thinking about a decision has a voice, including fear. But fear can have that voice and then I can say, okay, fear, I've heard you, <laughs> but I'm gonna take the consensus and figure out what my view is, right? Yeah. And so when you have a situation like that, instead, we'd love to, to encourage and hopefully teach and mentor the hybrid model, which is okay. I hear your fear. Never done this before. I get that. That's that's noted. That's needed. We got. We have to have some of that healthy sort of wary um, optimism. But I also heard that in that bravery of saying I'm going to try it, you probably need a little bit of help. So let's take the the cautious nature, but let's take the bravery and let's meet in the middle. Let's ask someone for help. Let's go in for guidance. Let's take a little bit of extra study. Let's take a course, but let's find that healthy goal of helping that patient, but also having that self-achievement without the worry you're going to fail or without even trying. And so that's what I mean by sort of with around our patients. We can either not help them at all, or we can be too bold because we don't want to show vulnerability. And I think that's one of the keys of perfectionists is they're so scared. Again, I'm speaking as a recovering one. So scared to let somebody see you fail, most of all yourself, I, even I like, though that often doesn't happen. I, I like this a lot. I, I was talking just a couple of days ago with Dr. Ivan Zach. And so he's the CEO yeah. at Galaxy Vet and just a genuinely neat, interesting guy. And he said, I've never heard it put so bluntly, but he said, you know, perfectionism is fear. And he said, that, that's mm -hmm. what it is. And, and now that you're talking about fear, because I, I sat with that a little bit and said, is that, is that really true? And I, I hear what you're saying, but is, is that true? And then as you're saying, well, there's really two different paths, but they're both fear driven. I go, oh, that's sort of starting to square up. Do you, do you, do you generally agree with that assessment? I do. Um, you know, if you think about how, if, if this is relating to, if you're like, you know, sitting there going, this is me, this is me. If you think about how perfectionism guides you, and let's let's take another aspect. Let's say with your team, right? So say you are a leader in your practice in some regard, whether management or a peer leader or a champion for some aspect, and you're tasked with a project that you have never done or is quite large or um, means stepping into a whole other realm that maybe you failed at before even. Perfectionists, again, tend to go to extremes. They tend to, and I think I wrote in my article about silent expectations, right? They often feel like if I have this expectation that this project has to be perfect, then I'm going to not really tell people around me what I need them to do and help me with, right? I'm Because I don't want to be bossy. I don't want to come across as, you know, taking over because I have that fear of being looked at that way. But I also then, I'm never clear. I don't give expectations of what our goals are. And then when someone presents me with something they've done for this project, then there's inherent disappointment, which often in body language is communicated to the yeah. team member, which then of course creates this conflict. So we, to your point, led by fear in both scenarios, instead of finding that middle ground of saying, I understand I'm me. And I understand you're you. Yeah. And for this project, our expectations are such. And so I want to discuss with you, same way we do share decision making in the exam room, I want to discuss with you, this is what I want out of this project, but what do you want out of this project? And how do we find that shared goal together so that expectations are out? They're on the table. We know exactly what they are. We hold ourselves accountable for our roles and then we regroup. I, I didn't do that as a young owner. I didn't want to be that person who, because especially 
I think a lot of them are the associates, which I was, that then become owners and you're working with the same people, but in a different role. And you do not want to be looked at as, if I can just say it, right? The bitch that just bought the practice. So you come out there and you, you're just like, well, whatever you think you can do, but that never ends well. But that stems from this perfectionistic tendency of I expect here and I assume everybody else thinks they should be up here, but that's not the case. And nor is this case healthy. Is so it, we have is, to sort of bring down. Yeah. It, is it, is it, is it perfectionism kind of getting trapped in two spaces? Is it, is it, do you think it's perfectionism of the job has to be done perfectly and I don't want to make other people feel micromanaged and I don't, I want to be the cool boss and I don't want to be the boss that people don't want to work for. And so then you're, you're completely, you're completely stuck at that point, right? Because yes. you're like, I, it has to be perfect, but I don't want to really communicate my expectations because then I, I will not be this other part of perfection. Like it doesn't seem like there's any way out of that. If, yeah, if you it, set yourself up that way. Yeah. Yes. And that's the key, right? Is that, um, I wrote this article because as I was reflecting on my first, you know, several months of ownership, I was thinking if I was mentoring people, which I do, what advice would I give them now as these young owners start, you know, whether they're in, you know, sort of a corporate partnership or they're independent, but whatever that is, if they are in this role, what is a better way to start? And I don't, and again, I, I, I don't like to look back on regret. I like to look at everything in life as a learning opportunity. And so I think this is just a way for, for us to think about how can we set ourselves up in our, especially to improve work culture, because that's really where this is stemming from, right? Is you, every person, especially perfectionists, they feel very, very nervous about someone else seeing a flaw because to them, a flaw creates extreme anxiety. And I think we all know that, right? It's that even though many of us have failed, right? If we look back in life, we failed. Sometimes we ignore the failure. Sometimes we, we're embarrassed about the failure. We do come back, but many of us don't go back in the same way or don't even go back to that same experience because it's so traumatic for a perfectionist. However, if we reframe that and say, how much could someone learn from you being vulnerable enough and brave enough. Those two can go together. That's the thing. We don't often think that bravery and vulnerability are together. We often think vulnerability is a weakness. It is a strength. So if you are brave and vulnerable in the same time as a practice leader and demonstrate, not be embarrassed, but just demonstrate the humility of a flaw or we'll say a perceived failure, because often it isn't. Often what we perceive as a failure is a minor blip in the road, but through a perfectionist, it's a catastrophe. Yeah. But then show how we learn together. You know, you misquoted a client. How do we learn from that experience? What process can we create so it's better next time? Something happened in a surgery. We're not, we're no one's perfect, right? How do we learn from that experience? How do we teach someone not to do the same thing and then get that personal reward out of mentorship. So I think it's all about reframing it and understanding that, again, a brave vulnerability is, I think, how I choose to lead as I move forward, is to yeah. say, it takes a lot to show somebody that I messed up. It takes a lot to admit a mistake, especially as a perfectionist. But the reward that you get from that vulnerability is actually so much more bucket filling than we realize. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that you say that, you know, and having that behavior modeled, that is something I feel like I've seen a lot more in the last, say, 10 years mm -hmm. than in 10 years before that. And, yes. you know, I had, a, I had a couple of mentors. So when you saw me, I'm a, I'm a Florida grad and uh, Uncle Mikey, as we call him, uh, Dr. Michael Sher was at Florida. Oh. Like I was absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I'm absolutely brilliant. But he would talk in rounds about his pile of bones. He's like, no, oh, yeah, I remember I missed that one, you know, on my pile of bones. And I remember just, I liked him so much in the time, but for someone who is a bona fide, and maybe you would say, he's such a bona fide genius. Like, no one's, you know, no one's questioning his competence, but I just, I thought that was such wonderful behavior and philosophy to say, well, I'll tell you about how I messed this one up. And um, it just, it made an impression on me to have this person who I just respected so much being willing to say, well, you know, I've, 
I've made I've made these mistakes. Hey guys, I just want to jump in real quick and let you know about some great continuing education I have coming your way. Guys, I've partnered with Nationwide to put together a series of webinars that are 100% free to you. They have race CE, they are good to go, and they are going to be, first of all, just genuinely entertaining and fascinating. The first thing I got coming for you is on November the 14th with my good friend, Dr. Emily Tincher. She's been on the podcast a number of times. I love having her here. She is uh, she is such a fun, interesting person who's a deep thinker. And so anyway, she is doing uh, a webinar called Clinical Empathy, the exam room skill that can transform your team. And this is, I've had Emily on the podcast before talking about clinical empathy. This is a really good skill building uh, webinar. This is great for, uh, for your support staff as well as your doctors, but your team leads especially, but uh, your technicians, your assistants, your CSRs, all of this is just, it's such a great communication content. I, I think you're gonna really like it. So anyway, that is on November the 14th. It is at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And then the last one in the series is on December 13th. It is with Dr. Simon Platt. It is called Head Cases, a Spectrum of Care Approach to Neurology in General Practice. So if you're a neurology buff, uh, if you like if you like seizures, not, not like if you like knowing about seizures, if you like uh, neurophysical exam tips, tricks and hacks, things like that, uh, this is going to be a great webinar. So again, this is on December 13th. It's at 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 10 a.m. Pacific time. Gang, I would love to see you there. Links to all this stuff in the show notes. Go ahead and grab a spot. I'll see you there. Let's get back into this episode. I have a. I was having a conversation with my team, and this comes from a practice manager named Maria Perita, who who I work with, who's who's amazing. But she's like one of the most optimistic, positive people, like can do people I I meet. And she, uh, her her life philosophy, as she told it to me, was how hard can it be? And I'm like, that's such a wonderful. It is. Idea. You know, she looks at she looks at like so that surgery. She would look at the surgery and go, how hard can it be? And yeah. I just think. How refreshing is that? Like, how wonderful would it be to have that be at least one of the driving voices in your mind of like, nah, you know, other vets do it. I've done a lot of surgery. How how hard can it be? And I just, right. um, I, I love how you put it. Of, I, I love your sort of board of directors where I'm just like, I'm not saying this is this is the defining voice, but it's one of the voices. And I think a lot of us have lost touch with that. Um, how hard can it be voice? I, I love that too. And I, I think that, that speaks to, and again, we're sort of this, you know, underlying, you know, tenet of fear is that a lot of us go into, and let's just even take practice ownership. We've been talking about it yeah. as an example. A lot of people look at practice ownership and maybe if they allowed themselves, again, I, I call that daring release, right? Because it's not easy. It's not easy to release that sort of, it's almost like a bodysuit, right? It's this control and sort of this safety in a way, right? Of sitting in this space of perfectionism. But when you let that go, and it can be slowly at, you know, at points and starting with baby steps, but you let that go and you actually look at yourself and say, what do I want? What do I want right now out of life? And if that's to you, it's like, I want to be a practice owner. And then that ugly, you know, fear that's sitting on your shoulder goes, you can't do that. Are you crazy? That's insane. Blah, 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 blah. You have to listen to it, right? But you don't have to follow it. And that's important, I think, because we don't want to get rid of all of our fear. Fear is needed in small, right? Otherwise, fear would say, sure. oh, I've got a cliff. I can just walk off because I can fly, right? right? Fear is needed. But but fear also is, if we think about where that started, it was because when we're living in caves and there's a, you know, a, a saber toothed tiger around the corner, fear kept us in the cave and away from, from threats. And it's still there, but we have a much better way of controlling it. And how hard can it be? Right. And so I, the other thing I think that has been really helpful as I, I've been working on this journey of releasing perfectionism is exactly what you mentioned, which is surrounding yourself with people who think about the world differently. Perfectionists tend to want to stay around perfectionists because it's like safety in numbers. <laughs> and, yeah. and right, because it also feels better for someone to say, oh, yeah, totally. I agree with you. A hundred percent. Yeah. It, 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 feels... val it validates what you're doing and how yes. you see. And it validates your fear as well. They're like, oh, yes. yeah, I would never let someone else do that. And you go, oh, yes. okay, good. I feel good about this. And then you're like, of course, I knew it. I was perfect. Well, you know, and, and it's just sort of this vicious cycle that you, again, trapped and you can't get out of. 
But when you allow yourself to be surrounded by people who have different different ways of looking at the world, um, have not necessarily struggled with the challenge of perfectionism, but strive for excellence, that healthy sort of hybrid form, it challenges you to think about, you know, what if I did look at it that way? Or what if I did take a step back and there, what I just saw is a massive mistake. You know, Maria might have been like, that, that, that's nothing. What, what, what's going on? Why are you thinking that way? And the more that you allow yourself to internalize those other comments, the more you can validate that, you know what, that was a little minor mistake and everybody makes them and I'm going to move on instead of internalizing that and having it stay with you for days and weeks and affecting other parts of your life. And I know that I definitely did that as a younger associate and I would let a case just linger and fester for, you know, a long, long time instead of surrounding myself with people who could allow me to think differently but also being brave enough to say, yeah, I, I made that mistake. I can't believe I did that, but I did, I did do it. Help me get through it. Because yeah. we often, as we get embarrassed, right? And we just sort of wallow in this alone. And being alone in perfectionism is awful. Absolutely awful. Because not only do you feel alone, but there is nobody there sort of, again, being, I'm going to just keep using Maria. I hope I get to meet her someday. Yeah. Being that beacon of light that says, "How hard, you know, how hard can it be? You're, it was, it was one mistake. You, you quoted the client four hundred fifty dollars instead of five hundred dollars. Yes, the client's response was as such, but it's not that you're the worst person. Let's just think about a different way to diffuse a client next time you're on a call. Yeah, right? I love it, uh, Natalie. Was there? Was there a turning point for you? Was there was there a time when you were was there something that made you stop and sort of assess? Because you clearly thought a lot about this, and you and yeah. you say it's sometimes you have a, a before vision, version of yourself and an after version of yourself. And, and what what was it that sort of made you sort of stop and, and take stock? Yeah, um, it was probably one of the hardest days of my veterinary career, and it was actually we we had been doing I was practice owner we were doing reviews. And we had, of course, our team review us, um, you know, myself and two partners. And I had set myself up, right, in the safe space of perfectionism of saying, oh, well, look at all this great stuff that's coming back. You're a wonderful yeah. mentor. You teach us, you know, you do rounds with us and all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, I had um, three comments from newer team members who said, you're really intimidating and unapproachable. And I'd never really had that direct feedback before, especially from a position of leadership. And if I thought about it in the moment, certainly now as I reflect, of course, I have many different feelings on it. But in the moment, I remember hearing that from my senior partner delivered in a way that I think if I had delivered that now would be different, but sort of just this very direct, almost like a brick hit me, you know, oh. you're pretty intimidating and really unapproachable and they don't, they don't really feel like they can come to you. In that moment, I know I went home. I didn't eat for two days. I oh, had wow. stress yeah. colitis. I'm thinking, how, could, how do I even go on? You know, and you, you start yeah. to ruminate and go into mm -hmm. this spiral of, I must be the worst practice owner anyone's ever had. Oh my gosh. If people think of this here, do my friends think I'm that way? And they just don't tell me, do, do my kids think I'm that way? You know, and you yeah. go into this really dark place. Yeah. And I, I had a, a, my best friend at the, you know, at, at that moment said to me, you do got two choices, right? That, that's what you got here. You can sit here and continue to wallow because it had been days of me really being in this dark place, continue to wallow and you are going to lose everything you worked for, right? Because practice ownership at that point had been my veterinary goal and I'd mm -hmm. finally achieved it and you could lose everything. Or you can take this and you can say, you don't want to be looked at that way because if you, the way you're acting, it sounds like you don't. And you can be super brave and sit down with those three people and get feedback on what they are seeing because you obviously aren't seeing it. And it's going to take strength and it may be even, a, it may even go down a little bit more before you go up, but you're going to go back up. Yeah. And I thought, it took a lot of guts for me to sit down with those people because they did give me a lot of feedback that I wasn't necessarily expecting or even in the moment wanting, yeah. but I wrote it all down 
and I sat with it and I said, you know what? This is probably the bravest thing that I've ever done for myself, but it's also the bravest thing you've ever done because they definitely didn't need to give me that feedback. But I, I realized like, that's not the leader I want to be. Yeah. And so it, it took a while though, to tease out why did I, why was I looked at that way? And that's where I came kind of to those silent expectations is that was a big part of it for me is yeah. working on projects with team members and not giving them transparency and not showing my weaknesses um, realizing that instead of them looking at them as weaknesses, they would realize that I'm human too. Yeah. It humanizes leaders to be that way. And perfections just don't, don't see that in the moment. No, it's, I, I love that you, thank you for telling that story. And, and again, I, I resonate with that so hard. Like I, I know exactly how you feel because you want to, you want to be the best boss and you want to be yeah. the best manager and the best doctor. And then when you get hit with, uh, with feedback like that, sometimes it's, it's really hard. Yeah. To let it go if, if that's what you really care about. I um you know, the way I sort of came into sort of thinking about thinking about perfectionism just from for myself is very much I ended up in, in sort of the same place as you is at some point you just get tired of getting trapped again and again. Mm -hmm. Uh and, and ultimately you have to pick your poison. And you and I think your like your friend was so spot on is you can just continue to do this or you can decide that you're going to try to make some changes, but those are your only two options is keep doing what you're doing right. or, or do something different. And, um, I just, anyway, I, I, I love that you, I love that you share that. And I, I, uh, I, I love this conversation so much. Uh, Dr. Natalie Marks, you are absolutely amazing. Thank you for yeah. being here. Where, where can people find you online? You're doing so much. I love your column in today's veterinary business. Uh, oh, where else can people find you. you and follow you? Yeah, so I'm, I do a lot on LinkedIn. I'm certainly doing a lot of edu educating. My website is marksdvamconsulting.com if people want to sort of check out a lot of the articles and blogs and where I'll be next. But um, I'm certainly around and I um, I really am on Facebook and Instagram too. Um, but I, I love, just like you, I love connecting with colleagues. And I think this issue is one that has sort of remained behind the screen and behind that big curtain for a long time. But I think the more that people talk about this and realize there's a, a huge community of recovering perfectionists <laughs> out there that um, have been where you are. And if you're feeling this way, you, you don't have to, don't feel like this is the end, right? That I'm a perfectionist, it's ingrained in me and I will never be able to change. Small steps make a big difference. And also one last thing I would say is you need to recognize the joy along the journey. We're so committed to it's got to be the if we don't hit the ultimate goal, the only way we can really find joy is the end result only for a second because then we got to move on. Yeah, we got to sound so trite, but stop and smell the roses and the little, little pieces along the way, because that's where we find purpose and meaning. Um, and often that's even more rewarding than the end of the journey. Oh man, you're speaking to my soul. That I, I anyway, I could do all. We could have a whole other conversation about that. <laughs> we We're gonna stop could. here, but that, I, <laughs> I, I have lived that reality so, so much, and I come in the same place as you. Of like, you just, you gotta let some of it go. You gotta stop yeah. this roses. Thank yep. you so much for being here, guys. Thanks for tuning in, uh, and everybody, take care of yourselves. All right. And that's it. That's what I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took something out of it. Uh, Dr. Natalie Marks, thank you so much for being here. She is absolutely fantastic, gang. Take care of yourselves. Be well. I'll talk to you later on.